Welcome, welcome to Geek View Tavern. Sit back, relax, enjoy your favorite cocktail as we visit the greatest comic book universe in the 1990s, the Ultraverse. I'm your bartender and host, Dave Oldbridge. In this episode, three Malibu Comics executives, me included, and a podcasting superfan begin the countdown of the top 10 covers of the Ultraverse. Welcome to part one. Watch us pull back the curtain on behind the scene details. Remember to like the video, share it with friends, and please subscribe. Okay, Skeeter, hit the intro. Welcome to Geek View Tavern. In this episode, Tom and Dave and Chris and our special guest, Mark Truex, are going to be talking about the top 10 uh, covers from the Ultraverse. So to my left is Mr. Tom Mason. He's one of the co-founders of Malibu, as well as one of the founding fathers of the Ultraverse, as well as Mr. Chris Ohm, who's right below him. Give us a wave, Chris. There we go. Hey. He's all, he, he, like me, is also a co-founder of Malibu and a founding father of the Ultraverse. And Mark, how many episodes of the Ultra Monthly podcast have you done at this point? Officially 39. So wow. longest running Ultraverse related. <laughs> that too, too well, I mean, that's to say. It, that's that's over three years, no matter how you stretch it out. Good for you. They're really entertaining. I like what you and Jeff do on the show. I'm excited whenever a new one comes out. Well, thank you. Uh, we love everything that you guys created. The Ultraverse was such a beautiful well, span in time in comic books in the 90s. And it was dense for, for that short period. You guys put out a lot of content there. So <laughs> I know Jeff and I have many more episodes to keep well, doing. It was dense in more ways than one. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we love it. That's right. Where, where can they find Absolutely. the Ultra Monthly Podcast? So if, if you're interested in jumping on now to the Ultra Monthly Podcast. Ooh, look at oh, you go. Yeah, you can find us on every platform you find your podcast. So whether it's uh, Google Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, uh, Spotify, uh, everything in, in between, come to our website, ultramonthly.buzzsprout.com, and uh, you can get all of our episodes, past and future. I am so jealous of your radio voice, buddy. <laughs> it's been fine-tuned and abused. <laughs> there, you, there you go. Well, you, you did a little voiceover for me for one of the shows for our Kirby show. Yes. So that, that was very nice of you. Thanks. Why don't we explain what we're going to do? Why don't you okay, say we're going to do a countdown from 10 to 1 of the top um, Ultraverse covers. Mark and Jeff from the Ultra Monthly Podcast submitted their list, and then I called it down to 10. So that's, that's the process that I wasn't going to talk about. So, at number 10, from February 1995, is this. Yes. Ultra Force number 5 by George Perez and company. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Oh, yeah. So, that, I assume, is Pix, because it says it's Pix's last stand. I assume that Pix getting blown up there. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. Saving the world, you mean. Oh, right. Right course the great the great thing about it is you can see how terrific the coloring a lot of that power comes from the color yeah 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 no question our color our coloring department was really kicking on all cylinders at that point well we could we could do a lot of stuff with the blacks that you couldn't do before right in terms of how how sharp they were so that 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 really makes this this cover in particular pop out and also as you go as you go through the the tent because i did peek at them before we started you'll see that the color pattern is very similar on a lot of these favorite covers. And I like how this, we, we, we list the name of the, the three biggest heroes in the team there at the top. That was kind of nice. Mm-hmm. It made that bigger. It was, a little, little hard to read. I have to, I have to get yes, some criticism it was, We, <laughs> we could have done better. Look, look what we did, it's so great and hard to read. So how did, how, how did this one make your list, Mark? So uh, aside from it just being an iconic death in the Ultraverse, which you guys did a great job of making sure if someone dies, yeah, we right? kept the, we it's kept dead. them dead. It's we over. did. Uh, not only that, with the death of Pix, but what's great is comic books always have this long history of kind of bearing the lead and doing like a false front, like, oh, is someone gonna perish in this ep- in this right. issue? No, of course not. Right, but they did. <laughs> they did on this. You put right. it up front and you delivered. It was indeed her last stand. So now moving on to number nine, everybody can see that. Oh yeah. yeah. 
That's Freaks number five. That's from uh, November 93, and that's Ben Herrera. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Yeah, I know. Isn't it great? Yeah, I, I love Herrera that. Herrera so cover. great, so underrated. I thought he was going to be like a huge star. I did too. And look, and we're still using the little white framing. I think Jerry Bingham came up with the idea to put a little frame around everything. Yes. But yeah, we we, we we didn't keep that for long, but I thought it was a nice touch, especially had, especially during the early launch days. We had a lot of elements. We had to put the Ultraverse logo, which can only run like that, or you can run, <laughs> right. you can run it up inside. Or, and then we had the corner box, because every every publisher had to go with the corner box at the time. And then you got the issue number, and then you've got to, you've got to say who the company is, Malibu Comics, which almost is irrelevant at this point. The border makes it sort of pop a little bit from the newsstand. I was gonna say, this one works great with the trade dress, though. Yes, yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. and, and, and does. Should should I uh, you know, clap ourselves in the back a little bit? I think that our stuff looked great on the stands compared to everybody else we were competing with at the time. Our well, trade you... dress was look, look, looked really nice. Well, we also had a couple of things. We had Jerry Bingham teach all of our colorists yeah. lessons in color theory and how to how colors blend together and how they work. And then the other thing we did is we did we deliberately went with darker palettes from us all of our covers. So we never had those happy 1960s, 1970s Marvel and DC colors where everything is red, green, and blue, and everybody just sort of. Well, and also having that full process coloring that we could, yeah. that we could do, right? And, and really do shade, uh, a lot of uh, elaborate shades, I felt yes. like, made a big well, difference. Yeah, what, 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 how did this make the list, Mark? Yeah, I think just some of like how the inking was done on this and the play with shadow on the feature, uh, like you said, it's already a darker color palette. And so the pieces that are highlighted from, you know, the flame and a blaze going on in the scene really is striking and comes out. Anybody know who that character is? That's the uh, master of the hunt. Uh oh, well, look, look at you go. <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize everything was in the same color palette. I'm excited to see how the tent shake out. <laughs> yeah, let me see. Here we go. So there's number eight. Ooh. Oh, That's yeah. number eight on the list. That's a solution cover by John Statema. And I don't yeah. think that guy got nearly enough credit for what he did on the solution. Yeah, it was and, astonishing. And, work. and almost no one was noticing because it was kind of late in the series. But boy, Statema's work, you can't really beat it, in my opinion. Yeah, it's beautiful. Oh, we'd get in a lot of trouble for that today, though. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's the kind of thing you look at now and go, well, we, we probably should have rethought that before we uh... <laughs> Yeah. Put it on Perhaps the, that's uh, not the best idea. Right. <laughs> it, 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 it definitely is a cover of its time, that's for sure. Yeah. Our, re our readers must all be 16, 17-year-old boys. So the girl on the left is Tack, right? From The Solution, and the girl is one of the villains? The other girl with the white hair is one of the villains? Correct. That is Casino. So that's oh, my, that's, casino. that's like okay. one of my favorite characters that that came I know I've heard, I've heard you talk I heard you talk yeah. about Casino. That's that's my girl. And uh, this is, you know, the one time she graced the cover. So <laughs> That's a really eye-catching cover. I mean, you see that on the stands, and if you know who those two characters are, that's still really nice impact. And poor Statema, I think he inked it himself, but good Lord, look at the work on the, the hair and stuff. There's a yeah. lot of detail in the muscle definition, but just the way like their bodies are contorted too, like makes it kind of striking and dynamic. I do miss the border though. Yep, yeah, by, by, by this point, we'd already started putting Malibu comics up in the top corner and we, we dropped the, the square around the uh, the frame, yeah. The rectangle. And maybe rectangle. we'll get a reprint where all the covers are remastered with the border added back in. There you go. Just for me. Yeah. <laughs> so So the next one is number seven. And it's one of two Aaron Lepresti covers on the uh, on the list. There it is. Oh, look at that. oh yeah. yeah, I love that cover. <laughs> it's so much fun. <laughs> when Lepresti brings humor to his work, I think it is better than when he tries to be too serious. I, I've, I've seen I've seen him do funny animals, and the stuff just sings. Whenever he's able to bring the two things together in one illustration, I'm always a big fan. So this this is the, the, the Bash, Bash Brothers, Brothers right? yep. which are the, the two characters that Gerber created at the very first uh, Ultraverse Founders yep. Conference in Scottsdale, Arizona. He pitched those like, like the first words out of his mouth were Bash Brothers, and everybody, for like three days, we could stop laughing. <laughs> it's a great then, title. Yeah. And look, the the color palette is, uh, is darker, which makes the Sludge logo pop. The two fists of different colors yep. that would pop out and then his teeth and his eyeball much like the ben herrera cover uh which was all teeth and eyeballs you can uh, <laughs> we, teeth we and eyeballs it. was our jam Tom. it was <laughs> apparently so <laughs> yeah but that was it, that was from november 94 and november that period has got a lot of covers on this list 
Well, just November, saying. So November 94 would have been drawn in the summer of 94 when just before the company was uh, officially up for sale. Yeah. Yep. What was nice is finally getting the Bash Brothers introduced because that was one of your first chase cards you released in, in the first uh, card yeah. series was Bash Brothers. I think they got two different cards and the entire time yeah. I was collecting, I was like, who are these guys? I don't see them anywhere. <laughs> finally, they debut Sludge 11. We get a cliffhanger in 12 and not to be seen again. There you go. Did, did Don Sim I think Don Simpson did the uh, character designs on those guys, I think, for the for card set. I think he did the cards, yeah. 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 Oh, well, Presti actually didn't draw that up, that the interiors on that one. How many issues of Sludge did Lepresti not work on? It wasn't very many. Just a couple, I thought. And, and bless his professional heart, Aaron has a very strict schedule. He has to start on this day and finish on that day, whatever. And Gerber was always so late with the plot and so late with the script that we would have to, that we couldn't have Aaron just sitting around waiting for Gerber. So we had to give Lepresti other stuff to do. And then the Gerber script would come in and we'd tell Aaron, Aaron, you got two weeks. And Aaron would say, I'm doing this. I can't do that. So yeah. it's not a reflection on Aaron for not drawing those issues. Gerber just held him up. What yeah. was your what was your favorite part about Sludge, um, Mark? Sludge, I, I liked his troubled backstory as like kind of the crooked cop trying to get out of the mess and then getting stuck into this monster where he could no longer even <laughs> express himself. Uh, one of the greatest villains we got out of the Ultraverse was Lord Pumpkin directly tied in with this character that kind of uh, monster vibe of the book that Lepresti brought to it that I know is a big passion of his is doing monsters. Uh, it, it stuck out from all the other books in the lineup. It, it had this certain kind of niche that just played incredibly well. And all the way back to the first cover where it's just the close up on Sludge's face makes you intrigued on what is this muck? Let yeah. me see it. Here, here's a piece of trivia for you. We launched the Ultraverse in June of 93. Right. And we and, and Hard Case was one of those three books. And we offered Aaron to draw Hard Case. And then he found out that we were doing a muck monster. And he agreed to wait like six months so he could his book would launch till October. And he, he always tells me that he regretted that decision, that he should have, should have taken the Hard Case gig. But right. he, he, loves, but he loves monster so much. That he, that he wanted to do Sludge instead. Here's my here's my favorite story, and this this goes back to the origin of Sludge and to Chris, where everybody was at the original conference in Scottsdale pitching their ideas or whatever, and and Gerber was was having trouble getting some traction with his stuff, and Chris suggested to him, and Chris jump in when I get the, this all wrong, but Chris said to him, why don't you do a monster book? Everybody loves Man Thing. Why don't you do a monster book? And Steve said, well, I already did Man Thing. I already did that kind of monster book. I, I would rather do something else. I'd rather do superheroes. And then Chris slyly said, I bet you can't. I bet you can't. I bet. <laughs> something along those lines. I bet. I, I dare you. I, I challenge you. I, I, I think I said it, I think I said it more like, you know, you're probably right. It, it, it probably can't. There, there's no original take that you can have on these kinds of monsters. Man. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> <laughs> and then, like two weeks later, Gerber goes, "I, yeah, I got one." I thought about that monster thing. And yeah, I have a take on it. I have an original take on it, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I love Steve Gerber so much. Me too. All right, go ahead. go ahead. Go ahead, Tom. I don't want. I don't want to. I don't want to get off the Gerber vibe. I'm. I'm into it. Okay. Gerber always had trouble meeting deadlines, and he always had money trouble. And we were always advancing him money for scripts that were due to come in. One time, we had. We needed pay. He wrote from a. Uh, he would write a plot and then come in in dialogue when the pencils came in. And at one point, he needed money, and we wouldn't give him the money until he came in and sat at the office and dialogued the pages <laughs> that he, they were owed to us. So he would come in. He would dialogue his. He would dialogue like ten pages, get his check, and leave, and come back the next day and do the other ten. Sit at the desk like it was a, <laughs> like it was an office job. Yeah. 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 And no, we, I, we gave him free coffee, so it worked yes. out. Yes, and I think. I think we advanced him so much money over time that he still owes us a script. <laughs> <laughs> that's, think... that's probably true, actually. Yeah. <laughs> All right, moving on to number six. Right. This is The Strangers from October 94. Now, curious, of the 10 covers, three of them are from October 94. So summer 94 was very stressful for us. <laughs> we were, we would hit the, basically, we'd hit the year and a half mark since the launch. Right. All the first flood of stuff was all done. What do you What do you do now? Like, what do you do next? What's your next thing? And uh, Rafferty was one of those things. Rafferty fact, was it. 
amazing storyline that was put out and the way that he traveled through the different books and made an impact across the way uh, was huge. That was a huge villain and an arc to put together. And the way he comes off on this, very reminiscent of like the killing joke, uh, is just beautiful. It's a really it's a really nice character design. And that character he's holding the knife to is the lady killer. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Well, okay, good. So Glad I got the, that right. So yeah. the Rafferty Rafferty plot line, Chris, how did that come up? Yeah. If I remember correctly, it's that we wanted to have something that we could tie the books together. We wanted that because we, we, everything was going off in the far-flung directions. It's like, how do we bring the books back together and get people interested in the central concepts that were driving the Ultramers? And so I think that's that's where Rafferty, the idea of Rafferty first came from. My memory is there was also the idea of, let's not do a crossover where we bring everybody together, but let's right. do a crossover where the villain is the one who crosses over that's into right. everybody else's book. Right. Right. So that's exactly right. We wanted to do something completely different that was kind of an ultraverse spin on how do we do crossovers. Yeah. Just the fact that he was unpowered in a world of ultras and inherently just hates ultras. <laughs> Going out there trying to kill as many as he can. And he did. His body count is quite high. I haven't done a firm count on it, but I mean, he is just laying waste the way that Robinson did all the intermissions throughout uh, the firearm series. And you meet all these ultras and Ultimately, they all get killed off one by one. That comes back to our love of killing people and killing characters. <laughs> that oh, was, and, and making them, them really dead dead. Apparently, great minds think alike because either right at the same time or just after Marvel did their whole Scourge thing where they went through and started killing off all their like, low-level villains and stuff. I like to think they copied us. but you know. I, 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 think, I think you're probably secure in the knowledge that that's probably the case. All right, boys, thank you, thank you so much for coming to Geek Tavern today and having this talk. Um, and so give us a wave, and we will uh, see you all next time. All right. Bye, everyone. Great meeting you, Mike. Bye, guys. Cheers. Thanks for visiting Geek View Tavern. Remember to like, share, subscribe, and click the bell to get notified. Come back soon.